you see me? It's OK, we're not going to play Wise Wally. The thing is that until I was 25 years old, I couldn't see me either. I'd done nothing. I hadn't left my mark on the world. I was invisible to myself, even. Ironically, until that point, I'd done everything that society expected of me. It took a huge step into the unknown in order for me to discover my place in the world. And I'm going to share the story of how I went from A to B by riding a bike around the world. Like most people here, I went to university. And upon graduation, I had that high-pressure situation where everyone's asking, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Now, I didn't know. So I did what was expected of me. I got a job. And with it, I got everything else. I got the money, the car, the house. I got respect from my friends and my family. I was successful. But I was incredibly unhappy. Diagnosed with depression, it took the help of a counselor to make me realize that all of my actions were pleasing everybody else, but not myself. Now, at this time, I didn't know what I could do to change my life. I couldn't see a way of changing it for the better. But an opportunity came along to ride a motorbike across Iceland with two friends. So I took it. And I can't begin to explain to you what a difference this made in my life. To find out that there was this adventurous freedom out there that I'd never known existed before. We arrived at the island with just our bikes, a map, and a compass, and everything to explore. We rode across deserts. We passed glaciers and mountains. We swam in hot water rivers. And at night, we camped under the midnight sun. I was alive. And it was these new languages, new landscapes that were inspiring me. Now, what it turned out that I'd tapped into was a core happiness from when I was a child. When we're young, we don't Everything's an adventure for us. We're out there exploring new things every day. This is me with my first bike. I've got the bunny bike. And for the first time, I'm going faster than I've ever been before. I'm going further than I've been before. And everything's in sensory explosion. I'm seeing new things. I'm hearing new things. I'm smelling and touching the world as I go through it. I'm feeling the wind in my hair and the burn in my legs. And it stripped everything down to a core connection with the planet. It was a connection to something bigger, a connection to something that's pure and it's lost in adulthood. When we're young, we don't realize how insignificant we are in the world, do we? When we're young, we're the center of our own universe. It's just as we grow up, we get smaller. And it was that simplistic way of seeing the world that I'd found on my adventure. And I wanted more. So I went on to decide to ride a bike around the world. And I guess. If we take that childlike mentality of looking at the world and we put it into an adult term, we would say, do one thing every day that scares you. Now, it just turned out that I did one thing for seven years that scared me. But that challenge excited me. It inspired me. And the challenge changed me as a human being. It took me from being a 25-year-old with depression to an around-the-world cyclist. Very early on in the journey, I realized that even the people with your best interests at heart lead you astray. They lead you on the wrong path. When you're young, you're told what's good and what's bad, what's sensible, what's impossible even. But at the beginning of my bike journey, I needed guidance as well. So I was asking for support from companies for sponsorship. I wrote out letters every day asking for equipment, for components, for bikes. I organized a meeting with the mayor and 50 local businesses to support what I was planning to do. But nobody replied to my letters, and nobody came to the meetings. At home, my dad was even saying, you know, you should settle down while you're young. You can do this when you retire. But I knew that I wanted to do it. And so I ended up spending my own money to buy the equipment that I needed. And I did what I think is probably the, the hardest thing of every challenge, which is taking the first step. And I did that alone. I cycled out of the UK unsupported. The way that people addressed what I was doing continued as I cycled through Europe. Every day, I was being told that I was either going to be attacked or killed by terrorists when I get to Iran. And these stories scared me. I didn't want to be the guy who wakes up with a hood over his head, being held to ransom on the news. I didn't want to be the guy who's found dead in a tent in the morning. I was scared to arrive in Iran. But when I got there, I realized that 
this was another country with some of the kindest, most generous, and intelligent people that I'd ever met. This is me sitting for a meal with a family who found me in the street and they invited me in. I ended up spending three days with them. It had taken me stepping out of my comfort zone into the unknown to realize that there was a world of helpful people out there who would go out of their way to make sure that I was okay. That kindness of strangers ended up spanning the whole of the 51 countries that I cycled through. But it wasn't only cultural problems that I came against. There were geographical challenges as well, and never more so than when I cycled across probably the most inhospitable place in the world, which was Tibet. This slide <coughs> is from the first morning on the climb to the rooftop of the world. It's on a desert, a desert with snow. It's like double bad. This is the worst conditions you could ride in. <laughs> And so, faced with this, I ended up having to carry, push, or pedal all of my equipment on the bike, everything that I own, up a hill to the rooftop of the world, to Tibet. The climb was incredibly difficult. There was snow that I wasn't prepared for, and as I got higher, the snow got thicker, the oxygen got thinner, and the cycling harder. The climb ended up taking four days, and I had to reassess my expectations of normal. I looked at this, and I thought, Okay, well maybe if you can see the top of a climb, then maybe it's not a climb after all. And <clears throat> that's a metaphor that I continue to use for every problem that the world throws at me today. But of course, getting to the top was only the beginning of the problem. I was then faced with living for three weeks at 5,000 meters in altitude. At these kind of places, the world's physics change. Water freezes like glue when you've got an average daily temperature of minus 10. Elastic doesn't stretch, putting up a tent's impossible. And then, with such little oxygen, every small task was an incredibly big challenge. Add into this that I wasn't going to places where people live. No one lives up in Tibet. So I'd occasionally find a military settlement where I could get the basic rations of instant noodles and biscuits. And when there was no snow, I had to find water in this frozen world. I'd end up walking out onto frozen rivers, smashing a hole in the ice, collecting water, knowing that if that ice broke and I fell into the water, there's no way that I would survive. Just when you think the days couldn't be any worse, then comes the night. The temperature plummets to minus 40 degrees, and I'm still sleeping in a tent. Now, sleeping was okay. I had an Arctic sleeping bag, a three-season sleeping bag, and I was wearing my clothes inside. I was, I, was I was warm. I slept well. But then you come to waking up, and you can see... But that's my breath frozen on the inside of the tent. It's frozen on everything. And then the worst part, undoing the first sleeping bag, dropping 30 degrees, undoing the second sleeping bag, another 10 degrees. And the first step, once again, like leaving England, the first step out of the tent was always the hardest, to go from this warm cocoon that's kept you safe through the night and step out into this frozen world outside. But we do what matters. And at that time, nothing mattered more than survival. I had to keep going. I stepped out, and I continued to push myself. I pushed myself into some of the largest environments in the world. And on the positive side, it was incredibly humbling to find how small one man is when you're faced with such big mountains. It put all of my worries from my youth in perspective. When I was worrying about how am I going to pay the bills, what do my friends think of me, suddenly it didn't matter compared with how am I going to survive just through this day. But having the weight of my own responsibility for my own life on my shoulders was incredibly difficult too. I'd find myself just stood still when a climb became too hard, or when the wind picked up and a sandstorm hit my face, and I'd just begin to cry. There were times, some days, when I'd push the bike for six hours through snow, through sand, and then at the end, after all of this hard work, I could look back, and I could still see the place where I'd packed the tent that morning pushing myself through limits that I never knew existed before. My time in Tibet came to an end when I met this man, who I could probably introduce as the most expensive taxi driver I ever took. <laughs> it turned out that it's forbidden to ride a bike through Tibet. The police found me, and they needed to remove me. They wanted to take me back to that desert where I started the journey. Now, for me, that was impossible. I didn't have a visa that was stretched long enough to go back there. I needed to go forward. They detained me for a week, 
And at the end of it, they came back and played this good cop, bad cop routine. So when I get the good cop alone, I start to tell him, you know, I can't go back that way. It'd be impossible. I need to go forward to Nepal. How are we going to do it? Well, it turns out that if you've got 200 pounds and it slips into the right person's hand, you can go quite a long way through this part of the world. So with that in mind, I took the last few hundred kilometers through Tibet in the back of a police car. I descended and came to the Friendship Bridge. I pushed my bike across it into Nepal. I found the first wooden shack that I came to, leant the bike against it, and looked around. And I had a moment that brought me to tears. I realized that I'd been in this frozen world. It was lifeless for so long. I'd pushed my limits to survive. And now I found myself in this beautiful area of life. I looked around. There were trees with green leaves. There were red flowers. I took a breath. I could smell the food cooking in the local cafes down the road. I could smell the, the shampoo of people washing in the street. And as I turned, I could hear the children playing in the school down the road. In that moment, I realized what I'd done. I'd ridden a bike from the industrial heart of the UK to the prayer flags and the incense of Nepal. In that moment, I realized that I'd gone from a time when no one believed in me to pushing my limits way beyond what I thought was possible. In that moment, I thought about every country I'd been through and all of those cultures that had been different and I'd had to adapt to. And through adapting, I got myself through situations that I never even thought I'd get myself into. And in that moment, I knew without a doubt that I'd go on to ride a bike around the world. I knew that I'd built something inside myself that was that strong. And it all clicks back to this moment as a child, that sensory explosion, that feeling of adventure. And I was big again in my own life. It turned out that all I needed to do in order to discover my place in the big wide world was that I just needed a bigger bunny bike. <laughs> now, what I'd hope to leave you with from my adventure around the world is that I didn't get to ride a bike around the world by playing it safe and conforming to society. I didn't get to find my true place in the world by conforming or playing it safe either. I would say that if you truly want to find your place in the big wide world, you've got to step out of your comfort zone. You've got to go into the unknown and harness that childlike adventurer inside you. And maybe more importantly, like I'm doing, enjoy the ride. Thank you.